Okay. I'm going to call this meeting to order at 6.31 p.m. Pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law, general law, chapter 30A, section 18, and the governor's March 15, 2020 order imposing strict limitations on the number of people that may gather in one place. This meeting, the North Reading School Committee is being conducted via remote participation. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings as provided for in this order. So thank you, everybody. This might be a quick meeting. That might, I'll knock on wood here. I might have jinxed us, but um, <clears throat> we're gonna begin with public input. I don't see many members of the public here, but there's anybody from the public that has comments. I literally don't think there's anybody from the public here, so we're gonna move on <laughs> to the student report. Sophia, I see you in the middle there. Would you like to update us on how things are going? Yes, hi everyone. Um, so I wanted to start with in academics. Um, the juniors were able to take part in the ACT this weekend. Um, and others are now registering for further dates for both the ACT and SAT. Um, the SAT is going to be held at North Reading High School um, April 14th at, um, for a school day testing. Junior, junior course selection meetings start this week and sophomore and freshman meetings will follow after break. Um, there are two new courses sparking a lot of interest among students. Uh, the first is there's the first honors art class, um, and this allows students to expand their artistic abilities to a new level, as well as a cultures, religion, reason, and philosophy class. Um, this is offered for sophomores and juniors and seniors. Um, it's a semester-based course, so half of the year is um, about religion and culture, while the other is about reason and philosophy, and the half year helps integrate change and um, diversity in thinking and pace. Uh, last week, students greatly benefited and appreciated the snow, snow day on Tuesday. After experiencing both um, a genuine snow day and a virtual one, many can agree that the breaks are not only appreciated in terms of helping our mental health, as well as many found that productivity was stronger upon our return on Wednesday. Uh, the day allowed for students to conquer catch-up work along with provided mental health advantages. And many students this year have struggled in finding a balance uh, in social aspects of high school while maintaining um, safety in regards to COVID-19 protocols. So this winter, many students have found ways to come together outside of school while following distancing guidelines. Um, Many have taken part in winter activities like sledding at the common, um, skating on the local ponds, and it's all in a year that has put so much stress on everyone. These small little activities have provided great relief. Um, on Tuesday, uh, the boys hockey team volunteered their time uh, to help the community by shoveling driveways after the storm. Also, the boys hockey team is supporting AJ Kata from Bishop Fian um, after a recent incident in a hockey game by selling and dispersing bracelets from an organization um, at B Bishop Fian. All proceeds are going to help AJ's Medicare. The boys hockey team has, has had a great season and is two, three, and one. Uh, girls hockey is six and one. Girls basketball is five and two. Uh, boys basketball is three and five. So all teams have had great records and the girls swim team has had an amazing season as they're undefeated. Um, they have their league meet on Thursday and have high hopes of winning for the first time in history. As winter sports come to a close, all teams are extremely grateful to have been given the opportunity and been able to play this year. After next week's break, uh, sports that have been moved to the wedge season will begin, including football, cheer, volleyball, and boys and girls track. The Social Activism Club is working on their first PSA project for the Massachusetts Black Lives Matter at Schools PSA. The International Club is learning about Chinese culture in honor of the Chinese New Year. 
Model UN attended HMIN last week virtually, and soon we'll be hosting a meeting focused on internet free speech. And Maskers has Tech Week coming up, so they're getting prepared. And then for student work, I wanted just to briefly talk about um, a project I'd been doing in my AP English class. Um, so it's basically what right now we're working on the argumentation part of writing. And uh, so we were doing this project called Chores for current events, uh, history, our experience, reading, entertainment, and uh, sports. And this model allows for us to research information and take it in from many uh, different areas to expand our argument bank. So we really focused on that current event area by looking and digging deep into President Biden's inaugural address. So we, throughout the last few weeks, have been looking at how important figures use different sources of argument uh, to express their message, like how in Biden's address, he talked about unity and hope for the future. Thank you very much. Any comments or questions for Sophia? I will say I, I appreciated you commenting on the snow day. Do you do you think that was because there's a lot of snow? I mean, would you do you want all snow days to be, you know, real snow days and extend? And again, with the caveat that you're extending later into the summer, or do you like sort of a mix of them? Personally, I really like the mix. Um, on a day like Tuesday where there was just so much snow, it was really nice having that day. So you could do whatever you needed in your day to just catch up. But if there's like some days where there's just like not a lot of snow, having that ability to be virtual is really nice because you don't have to worry about like student drivers like in the snow and hard conditions. Yeah. And I think we, for some of the half days that just happened, there were, there were the SATs too. Um, do you think people appreciate being able to take them at the school as opposed to finding somewhere else to take them? For sure. So um, one of my friends, she has tried to sign up for one of the tests and has gotten canceled four times. So this more threading one is allowing for students in that situation to have a more secure date because it's more on the school's end rather than a random location by college board. I wonder if that's something that even in the future, I don't know how, I don't know how it usually works, but I wonder if that's something in the future where we can even think about that. I, I thought that was a great, a great outcome of this year that we were able to do that for our students. And I don't know, I, I don't know if it's something we could ex expand in the future, but I'm glad we were able to do it. So other comments, questions, anybody? I was, wondering how, I was wondering how the uh, football season is going to work with the, with uh, the amount of snow we've had. Um, uh, we'll have to, I guess I guess we're still probably three or four weeks away from competition, but uh, it's not trending in the right way the next couple of weeks, I don't think. Yeah, um, so I play, well, I'm on the track team. So what they, we've been told so far due to like the snow and stuff is mm -hmm. It'll most likely not be like four weeks until we actually have competition um, yeah. just to try and get rid of the snow. Maybe the hockey team will sell it off for them. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Thank you, Sophia. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I don't think there's anything on the, on the agenda that you're really going to care too much about. Maybe the reopening update, but as always, feel free to stay as long as you like or drop off if you have stuff to do. Okay. Thank you. Have a nice night, everyone. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the reopening update, which we've been open for a while, but Dr. Daly. You're muted, Dr. Daly. Now you left the meeting. He looks, he's been in and out. I, I wonder if Dr. Daly is having some. Uh... There we go. Chat issues. Can you hear me? We can. All right. Yeah, I'm having some some technical difficulties. Um, 
so yeah, the term reopening is making a comeback. It's there's a lot of discussion around reopening across the country, and it's just means different things. You know, there's a lot about talk about you know return to school, and it's really we we've been in school, and so you people need to remember too that you know there's a lot of districts that the kids haven't crossed the threshold all all year, right? So it's a little bit different in North Reading. Um, our challenges are about you know trying to bring as many kids back in person as soon as it's safe to do so. So. Um, the, uh, you know, the snow day piece is really interesting. I was trying to weigh in, but I wasn't able to, but, uh, I did receive some great letters from the students about it. And I think there is a mix of, of days that are, you know, times when it's appropriate and times when it's, um, you know, and, and that's why we try to, to have that balance. So, um, definitely some challenges with the weather, even, even on the horizon, we're watching some other storms that are developing. So a couple of things I just wanted to talk about reopening. So our positive uh, cases are certainly something we're watching very closely. Um, we, we've got, you know, for the month of January, um, we ended up with uh, 40 students who were positive and seven staff members. It's down a little bit from 44 in December students and seven uh, employees. Uh, February, we are, you know, just just in one weekend and we're at 16 students and two, two staff members. So certainly things that we need to watch and be concerned about. We did have to make the decision last week to close the little school for a number of days. That was due in the beginning. That was because purely because of um, staffing. We just had, because of the particular classes that were involved, um, they were some of the, the younger uh, students who are, you know, there's a lot of adults in those rooms. There's a lot of um, specialists who come in and provide services to the younger students. And the way the contact tracing worked, it just touched so many adults and students in the building that from a staffing perspective, um, we realized the safest thing to do was to remain closed um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And we were able to, as many of those um, staff and students were able to return to school, we were able to open uh, safely today. But I think it is important to note that we did have, for the really the first time um, this year, there was some transmission at school. You know, so we've had I've been reporting low transmission. We did see some transmission in in some of the classrooms. Um, again, one or two cases that that we did see transmission. We did not see out of all the students that were out, which which again we don't really report on all the. The, the folks who are close contacts. But again, we're putting every single student who's within six feet of um, the other person. And in some cases, we're putting out entire classrooms because it's it's more challenging to, to tell who is within six feet when you're in those younger grades, where obviously the children have a more difficult time, um, you know, practicing social distancing as much as we'd like, right? Just through developmental, you know, what, what's with their age. And so we, out of an abundance of caution, we put the whole classes out. We did see a few instances of, of transmission, which is certainly concerning. Now, if we were not already closed, that would have been a reason for us to consider closing to make sure that it didn't spread any further. Um, so we have not seen additional um, transmission now since that initial transmission. But during the time that we were closed because of staffing, we did see it touch upon um some others as well. And so that is, you know, obviously a concern, something we're keeping a close eye on, but it is a little bit different with, with some of our younger classes than, um, than it is with, with middle and high school. So I don't know if anyone had any questions there. I did want to talk a little bit about the dashboard and the communication. So any questions just about the little school situation? I have none, anybody? Seeing none. Okay. Yeah. So I did receive a couple of uh, notes last week, either directly or through um, some of the nurses, that people are just feeling fatigue. And, you know, quite honestly, I'm feeling the fatigue of sending out a daily um, message that has the updates with the cases, updating the dashboard every day with the, um, with the number of cases in every, in every building. So I put out a feeler on Friday to the community 
just to, to say that we would be discussing a little bit tonight whether we wanted to continue. Do we want to shift to, uh, you know, some of the parents have suggested a weekly update. Some parents have suggested only reporting, um, you know, to those parents if it happened in their school. But I, I will tell you my position, and then I, I, I wanted to hear your thoughts. But um, in response to my my mention that we were discussing it, I received more emails, um, and all of every, every email that came in um, was discussing how they wanted me to continue doing just what we're doing. And they were saying that, um, you know, first of all, if you've got students at multiple schools, you'd much rather one email from me with multiple information than getting one email for every school you're in. Also, so many people are in activities with students from other schools, soccer and, and, and dance or whatnot. You want to know what's happening in a larger community. Many people said they appreciate having, um, although it's, you know, it, you know it's, it's like turning on the news. Sometimes you hear things you don't want to hear, but it's, it's the truth. And, and being aware that students and staff are still testing positive, um, people seem to feel the overcommunication was important. And some of those folks that wrote are educators in other districts who are approaching it differently, and they said they really appreciate the, the constant communication here. But one thing I will point out, even our, our uh, NREA leaders spoke to me today and asked for the breakdown of by school. And I said, that's in the dashboard that I update every single day. Now, we originally had said that we wouldn't be um, listing that in the, in the emails that I would send out. But I'm wondering whether maybe it might be worthwhile to, to just put a link to the dashboard in that email and maybe change up freshen up a little bit some of the language in that email. I've basically been using a very similar message since we started back when we had, you know, three students and one the staff member back in October. So I might freshen that email up a little bit, add some more information. But essentially, you know, if people feel that the information is not important, they can they can move through that email rather quickly. But the people that really are looking for that information, I feel that there's a need to give it. So that's my position. But I certainly want to hear what the committee thinks about it. Why don't we just go around? Candidate McGowan. <laughs> uh, thanks, Scott. Um, so uh, my feeling is that that, in, that the communication uh, should continue. Um, you know, tweaking the form. I think you know whatever you think is a good tweak. Probably make uh, certainly putting a link to the dashboard in the email makes sense. You know, my sense of the email is. Uh, you know, it's the first paragraph that is the, you know, update, updated information and the rest of it is, is pretty much the same information. Um, you know, so it's not like you have to read the whole email every time it comes out is, is I guess is what I'm thinking. So, yeah, um, I, I think an update, I think a link, you know, to the dashboard is probably would be, a, I, I would certainly think it, think it would be helpful. I, I do appreciate how exhausting it must be for you. I mean, it's exhausting as it is just tracking all the cases, uh, but getting ready to send another, these emails out uh, on an almost daily basis. But uh, if you if you can continue to manage it, I think it makes sense. Sure. And uh, just to clarify, like I, I don't, I'm reporting to the Department of Ed anyway. I'm I want to know anyway, so that, of that's not going to change. I'm just saying that you know I get it. I I'm I'm fatigued with it as well, but. You know, I, I don't want to, ever want anyone to tune it, tune out the messages, but at the same time, it's like, um, you know, I think for those people that, that need the, the constant reminders and, and the updates, they want to know. We, I never want someone to find out uh, down the road that there were 15 cases at the high school that, in January that they never heard about, you know. So I think that that's important. Yeah. And I do think and I do think more people are likely to tune out if they stop getting the emails than if they then by getting too many emails because they'll stop thinking about it as much. Okay. Candidate Boutwell, breaking news. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. Um, Patrick, I have to say I, I am certainly an advocate of continuing the emails. Um, if I knew, I knew we were talking about it today. If I didn't, I probably would have been one of the parents that emailed to say these do add value. Um, I actually had some parents reach out to me directly as well, sort of advocating for that. And I was already very much so aligned with them. Um, I do think adding a link to the dashboard would be helpful. So if 
maybe it can minimize any questions you get about, you know, things in aggregate. Um, and, you know, this, I, I hate that there's an administrative burden on you. The stock email is, is certainly fine. I don't know if you'll trigger inquiries by changing it, right? Like, why is this language change? I, you know, that type of thing. So, um, and I know that's even a burden just rewording it. Um, but I, I think it, what you've been doing is working. I, I hate the administrative burden, but I, I hope that it, it continues. Yes. Thank you. I, you know, something that's kind of interesting too, is people, um, if I'm delayed, like I, I try to, you know, I don't send out the email until we've completed contact tracing or we've, we've answered these questions and people want to see their case, you know, like they, if they're aware that, a let's say a colleague two doors down was positive. Maybe they know that because of a personal relationship. If they don't see it for me, they're, they're looking for it. Right. So people, you know, I think waiting a week on that can be, you know, it's, it's comforting sometimes to know that all the ones you're aware of are accounted for, and there's not more out there that you don't know about. If that makes any sense. Chris, going clockwise on my screen. Thanks for justifying Mr. Buckley. Uh, you know, I, I agree. Um, I think it's, I think these do an excellent job and I, I completely understand your fear that in, in general, one has to question uh, about finding the balance between oversaturating and under informing and that some people might tune it out if they see it regularly. But I think uh, Mr. McGowan was completely correct in saying that if they disappear, that's when people will really put it on the back burner and they'll, that, that daily remind, not daily, but that, that reminder coming in as each case comes out, I think creates that feeling in the community that uh, we know what's going on, that there's transparency. I think that's very important. And if some people tune it out, I, I that, that's too bad, but I think that's, that's the risk one takes to make sure that you're transparent as I think we need to be in this case. So uh, I think you're doing an excellent job with it and uh, keep going. Janine? Um, I agree with keeping the update as needed, um, be it daily or, you know, hopefully at some point in time it can be reduced to weekly, monthly, and then not have to be anymore. But um, I do agree with keeping everyone updated. Um, while it might be um, cumbersome to get the email, at least you know that something's being done and you don't have to wonder and worry, you know, gee, you know, what's going on in the world, um, especially where my child is in. So not that I have a child in there anymore, but it's still, it's interesting even for me to see the updates that come through. So I, I wholeheartedly agree with keeping it as is. And we're unanimous on that. I agree as well. I think you know, feel bad about the administrative burden, but you know, for, for parents that don't want to receive it, you know, Dr. Daly's not hiding the the content in there. He's not saying, you know, educational whatever forum, and then there's something else tricked you. It's actually a COVID update. I mean, you know what email it is. If you don't want to read it, don't read it. But at the end of the day, it's better to give the information. And I actually think beyond that, like, I don't think everybody's gonna think to check the dashboard every day. And so that's why you get the email because I don't usually check the dashboard. I think I might have checked it one time. And so I like seeing it. And when something like the, the school closure for the little came up, I honestly wasn't that surprised when it came up because I saw all the cases, you know, and as a parent, if you see a bunch of cases starting, it might actually make you think about maybe I don't want to have a play date or I don't want to do something else. So I think, I, I think you give them, you give them the opportunity to review it by sending it. You can't, you know, again, if somebody doesn't want to read the email, it takes three seconds to delete the email. So, Dr. Daly, any more on the reopening? <clears throat> You're muted still again. Sorry, I'm shifting back to the computer now that I got it working. Is is COVID-19 update elsewhere? I just, forgive me, I'm trying to open it right now. Or I just wanted to provide that update. Um, so we we got on, I I held a forum last Tuesday, um, shared information about COVID nineteen testing. We put out a survey just to get 
a sense of who would be participating if we were to do pooled testing. Um, the numbers were pretty similar for staff and for families, a little bit higher for staff. Um, but it was, you know, the Binax testing consent was, was in the 80s. Um, and the pool testing was in the mid 70s to, to, to high 70s. So close to 80 percent and, and close to, um, you know, 75 to 80 percent. So we are, we are moving ahead. We're getting more information. This week is actually the first week of the, of the pooled testing. And so we're trying to absolutely, you know, build this plane as we're flying it because we're, we have a webinar tomorrow to get more information, but we're also trying to, to give them numbers. So we're, we're, we're pulling it together as soon as we can. And the, and the goal of, is to have as many folks tested in the next six weeks. This is week one. Next week is, is not, does not count. And then there's five additional weeks after that. These are the weeks when um, the testing is paid for by the state. And at the end of that six weeks, um, there's not additional funding to continue it at this time. So we're, we're really looking to do it for those six weeks. And the main purpose of this, as I explained in the forum, is to lessen folks' anxiety, to know that, um, that there are, are less, um, you know, the, to get that reassurance that you are that you are negative. So there's a lot of logistics for us to figure out. There's a lot of questions we still have to answer, but we're working hard on that uh, at this time. Thank you very much. We'll move on to new business. Yes. Okay. First thing on new business is the first reading of policy JHFBR. Janine, are you going to lead us in this discussion as well? I guess Chris is leading us. Why don't you make? Okay, hold on a second. <clears throat> I'll, be make a, I'll be make a motion. We'll get a second, and then we'll discuss it. That's yes, okay. thank you very much. And uh, there we go. I was for that. Uh, I move. Where, oh, I need my language. I'm not a very creative person, Dr. Daly. Hold on. While this, comes, while this comes up, revisiting an issue from a moment before. Can we officially title the uh, the updates Dr. Daly sends out as the daily updates, or is that too long? <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Right, Let me just pull up. I had the document open, so I just had it minimized. How about this? If I, if I can have a motion to move to approve the first reading of policy JHFB-R and to keep the track changes as, as delineated in the document. So move. I'll second. OK, discussion on this. Uh, and here we go. So he's pulling this up. I'm pulling mine up. Um, so this was. Um, uh, do you want to give you? A, I'll give you a quick overview of it. This was a, um, a look at um, slightly changing our policy, or uh, I say clarifying our policy for um, overnight trips uh, in the wake of COVID complications. Um, we're now kind of really needing to put a value on flexibility in trips, the ability to cancel them and get full refunds, the ability to uh, watch our liability. And uh, these concerns have led uh, have led uh, us and the committee and the subcommittee to, um, to talk about putting a new provision in that basically encourages um, trip leaders to seek out third party organizations to organize their trip as ways that kind of resolve all of those issues and uh, designates uh, Mr. Connolly as uh, a point person for them to run any of these details by and empowers uh, his office to insist on third party uh, groups if the trip is over a couple days in length. Excellent. Anybody have any thoughts or changes? I have, I have one suggestion slash question, but Janine, go ahead first. Um, it's, it's actually the procedural part of the policy. So it goes not only to overnight um, procedures, but it also, or policy, sorry, but it also goes to like the China trips or the Italy trips or, and things of that nature, um, which obviously they go through a third party for those. But um, once again, it's just the procedure part of the policy. That, that makes any sense. Great. So my only question slash concern was number seven on under scheduling. 
where it says every effort will be made by the district to secure a trip that offers the best deal for parents at the lowest cost. I don't want this to be like a bidding thing where you can't take a lower, you can't take a more expensive trip if we think it's a better trip. And so just the language of that by saying that we'll get the lowest cost. I just want to make sure that, you know, if there's if there's a provider that we think might be better or might offer something a little bit better or a little bit safer, or maybe better hotel, something like that, that it's that we don't I, I just want to be clear that we don't have to accept the lowest cost bid on something. If there's a, you know, at, at a even if it just says like at a reasonable cost or something like that, I just worry about our policy saying we're accepting the lowest lowest bid. Yeah. Um yeah, I, I hear what you're saying there, Mr. Buckley. The um I think and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. Daly, but the idea of that language was to kind of offset concerns that by pushing towards third party uh groups we're gonna raise the cost on things. And that's not the idea behind it at all. Um yeah. I, I I hear what you're saying about I think the intent behind number seven is fantastic, but if the language can lead to that conclusion, then we can we can speak the language. Yeah, yeah. it's tricky. I mean, to, to be honest, that there's a you know sometimes when we book individually for these trips, that there there are, there are bonuses and deals and points and all those things that that could be lost by going through a, a vendor, you know. But I think I think what we've seen, Michael, you can speak to it in the business office, you know, especially last year. With all the refunds that we had to do, um, we we just found it inordinately more challenging when it was not booked through through an agency, you know. But again, this policy update would give discretion for the business office to to make reasonable decisions. But it it just tries to streamline the process. I don't know, Mr. Connell, if you want to speak to it at all. Yes, thank you, Dr. Daly. I think that's that's the intent. Certainly, number seven, first and foremost, is not really intended to say we're looking to to go through a, a formal bid process and, and offer it to the low bid. I think it's more the latter of what um, Mr. Buckley was saying that we're you know every effort is going to be made to to make sure it's a fair kind of you know market value um, you know deal for that for that trip to the families, and we're not. Going to look to substantially increase the cost by by going through a third party agency. It's still going to be a very competitive, um, you know, price and in, in, in deal that is offered. And if if all else is equal and in, uh, in terms of the the accommodations, um, then we would look to obviously secure the, the the lower cost for for families. But it, I think that's really the intent. And as Dr. Daly said, the, the 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 overarching kind of emphasis just to to present this type of language is is um, in a situation just that could play out with a last minute cancellation for something that is just so so unforeseen um, for these extended trips. These are really meant to be kind of those trips that extend beyond a weekend. Um, you know, working with a with an agency, I think, does limit the level of kind of liability back to the district in terms of. Um, working through refunds and cancellation language of, of that type of a, a trip. So we would like that flexibility to kind of authorize that requirement. Should we, should we see the, uh, that it makes sense to do so, or it could be in the best interest of the district to do so. Yeah, and, I, and I'm in favor of the policy overall. I just, I just wonder if we just should just say something like lowest reasonable costs or something like that. <clears throat> just, just to make it sure again, it's just how I, I was looking for anything that might be confusing in the future, and that was the only part that I was a little bit worried about. That we're we're not saying we have to accept the lowest cost. So, and yeah, maybe I might suggest maybe we change the word "deal" to "value" or something too. As I look at it, you know, I was thinking that as well. I, I, the, yeah, the most offer, offers the best value for parents at the lowest reasonable cost. Yeah, I like that. I I like that as well. Me too. So do you want to amend your motion, Chris? Technically, you don't have to because it says track changes. Well done, Ms. Brianna. Okay. I do not as want to amend my motion. As modified. Chris is standing by it. Okay. Any other comments? Okay. Then we'll vote on the motion. Chris? Aye. Janine? Aye. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. I'm an I as well. Okay, thank you.
move on to the seam collaborative i'm assuming everybody did their homework and read through everything here <clears throat> dr daly do you want to highlight anything or just take questions on this sure i'm just you know this um process is i'm still i'm still learning all of uh the process for being a member of these two collaboratives but they do you know kathy lawson and greg zamuda do a fantastic job they keep us well uh, you know in, in the loop of all updates and changes um, there's some real positive um things happening with seem collaborative they're doing some great some great work still keeping the the cost down the tuitions down and really providing us with so many supports not just with the special education programs which obviously is 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 a major thing that they do but they do so many other things for all of our um staff uh, to participate in, in job alikes. We do the job share with our UDL coach. There's just so many great things happening with Seam Collaborative. And, um, you know, they, they they really do a thorough job of presenting all the budget and all the, the ideas. And, and, you know, the board is very supportive um, and, and, you know, voted to support this. So I just wanted to share with everyone tonight. Thank you. Any comments, questions, thoughts? The only, the only thing that I would say is number one, it's pretty impressive that it's only a 2.75% increase for member districts. The, the actual percentage of increase has gone down for the last four years. And then, and, and I believe that it's a very low enrollment fee, but it seems like we only have one student in this. And so I just wanted to make sure that the enrollment fee justify, even the enrollment fee for just one child justifies us being a member district. Michael or Patrick? It it absolutely does. I mean, like I said, even the enrollment is one piece of what we get from this partnership, um, and and it's always there for us when we need it by being members, right? So, as with all special ed placements, there may be things that pop up at any point in time during the year, even forty five day placements or or other considerations that we might need that that we work closely. We've also subcontracted with Seam for support with ESL uh, teacher services, with mental health supports. There's just, there's so many resources available to us as a member district. Um, right. it, it's, yeah. it's very valuable. Michael? Yeah, absolutely, I'll just add, I mean, I think that they've, they've kept the membership fee the same for the last decade. It's about $5,000 a year to be a member. And even if having one student as some of the budget documents highlight, um, you know, it's over $20,000 cost avoidance and savings. So. And I, I actually project that we're going to have a little bit, by the time FY22 comes around, we're going to have a lot more than one student. I think we might have either three or four. So the cost of avoidance will be there. It's certainly worth it. Absolutely. Excellent. Anybody else have any thoughts, questions? Okay. Move on to the mid year update school improvement plans. My suggestion on this one is that we take any comments or questions by school, by, by, by level at least. So maybe if anybody has any thoughts or questions on elementary, then middle, then high school, unless Dr. Daly, if you have any overall thoughts or anything. I'll share this here. So again, thank you very much. I think our, our principals have done a great job. Um, Mr. Maloney working here with the Bachelor School, um, updating this plan um, mid-year to check in. And he's obviously worked with Mr. Colleen for those pieces that were hit on in the first part of the year. Um, a lot of our schools have updated their goals. This is part of a larger goal within the district to, to really look at our school improvement plans, make sure that the goals are all actionable and measurable, and to try to align a little bit more with the district plan, with our educator goals, our administrator goals, and also with one another. Uh, not that all three schools at the elementary level or even the middle school, high school, all need to be the same, but to have more similarities and differences. So the administrators have all taken on this task this year. Um, you probably see some of it reflected here in their goals and their and some changes, but you're going to see more of it as it moves forward. Where there's, um, they really looked at each other's plans and also some other plans, and and said, you know, what do we like? What's working? What could be different? What could be better? And so uh, we're seeing a lot of progress here that may not be that obvious at first glance, but. Um, but we're certainly seeing some some real some real changes coming down the pipe. So. OK, 
Okay, does anybody have any comments or questions or thoughts on the elementary plans? Diana. I just wanted to make a comment. Um, when I was reading through them, and then just recently when we had the meeting with the Hood School presenting, um, I just wanted to say there were comments throughout in the school improvement plan um, for Mr. McKay, and he mentioned this at the meeting too, but that hand in hand together we can um, and all the work that's being done there and that he called out. I just thought given this environment today was so important and I just I just want to commend him and, and that school for prioritizing that and trying to make that community feel still be there even in this virtual environment. And he called out different ways that he's been doing that. And I saw it in the meeting and I just felt like I needed to recognize it because I thought it was such a fantastic prioritization given everything. It wasn't just about academics. It's about the social emotional and all of that, which really needs to be a priority right now. So I just wanted to mention that. Um, but that's all I had on the elementary ones. I can't see everybody on the screen. If you're saying anything, you just unmute or just raise your hand on there. I. <clears throat> The only comment I had on the on the elementary, and again, I think I think they're all great. Um, you know, I think it's funny because you can you can hear the t you can almost hear the principals saying some of the things because you know it very much is in their voice. But I, I don't want to be negative. But the one thing I did want to call out, and I want to call us out more than anything, is on the little school one, where when I'm reading through it and it says a comparison of September I ready data 2020 versus 2019. Identifies, identifies a slight deficit in students reading in 2020. And then it says understandable due to the COVID closure. But this is a, something that for years now, we've had on our budget trying to get reading specialists at the little school in particular. And it's just frustrating when we see something that was requested by an administrator that we weren't able to fund because they saw something happening. And then we see an identified decrease in proficiency because of it. And so I just think, again, for us, I just think that's one thing where this helps us when we're prioritizing what we're gonna do for the budget next year to see that, you know, when administrators are asking for support in a particular area, you know, if we can't do that, sometimes it can lead to, you know, consequences. And so I just think it's something that we really need to prioritize in I know for the budget subcommittee, we're going to try to make sure we address that this year as well. Okay. Um, thoughts or questions on the middle school? The only thing I'll say on the middle school is that um, the survey, the staff survey, I don't know if you guys took a look at that, but there was some declines in um, in those surveys. So I found that very interesting, and I I'm sure it's a reflection of the COVID environment. But um, you know, there were some decreases there. Um, but it was it was nice to see the student side of it was still very positive, or at least the, the trend was staying um, consistent. But you know, you you can tell some of the the staff is probably struggling, and I think that. Um, was a reflection. I, I I actually wish I could see that across the district. So it's nice to have. I'm glad that um, Ms. O'Connell does that. I think I think my only comment on this one was I've heard a number of complaints about math, and I know we had a forum about this where this came up, but math didn't seem to be off from the numbers here, but reading did. It seemed like only 27% are hitting the reading level, and Again, it's consistent with like what we saw at the little school as well. Um, I, I, I don't have any valid thoughts on this one. Just wanted to point it out because it seemed like it, it was surprising to see only 27% hit whatever, what did it say? 27% of students have reached their growth target in reading, which is a pretty, you know, seems seems pretty low. And, and hopefully we're identifying, we're, we're, you know, making sure we're looking at that as well. Okay. I know that, but go ahead, Dr. Dunn. I can just jump in. I just want to say that, you know, one of the things with the middle school that the other schools are also looking at is, um, you know, Ms. O'Connell's use of data, right, with her team um, in, in, in the council. And, you know, I just think even the presentation, there's lots of links, as Diana mentioned, to surveys, to other ideas. And I think 
trying to make these documents a little more interactive is something that we're, we're looking at doing as well. So, um, you know, I, I think that's a, a good goal for us to have. Great. Any thoughts on the high school plan? I mean, I'll just reiterate, I think I mentioned when the original improvement plan came out, I thought it was a little less robust than some of the other ones. And I know that we're hopefully working on that a little bit more for coming years. But, you know, I, I don't think we have to rehash too much the comments just because this is just updating on the previous plan. I think if I if I could, Mr. Buckley. Um, sure. You know, ongoing conversations here. I just had a great meeting this week with Mr. LaPrette about this document being a real driver for change. Um, the high school has a slightly different model than the other schools, and that's something we're looking at as well. They've um, historically had sort of a two-year plan, and I think that has a lot to do with budgeting and trying to get out ahead of some of the budgets. And, you know, I think they're in, there's so many moving parts at the high school that it's a little different. But we're trying to, to look at that and see if we can get um, on a more similar cycle to what we're seeing with the other schools and to really um, look at those goals and I, I'm, I'm happy to see with these goals how much more specific they are um, already you know I think that the, the council took some time to look at and make those goals very specific and timely um, and I think we're going to continue to see that even uh, develop even more and get even more specific and to really talk about what there's other pieces in their goals that uh, address each of the departments. And, you know, some of us are on the athletic subcommittee or the fine arts subcommittee, and we're hearing about classes and courses and positions. And um, we're really going to try to make all of that a little bit more goal driven. Right now, in my opinion, some of the bullets appear almost like wish list items. Um, and I think if we can make them more goal driven and, and make sure that by being published in that document that we're all all members of the high school community are committed to those as goals moving forward and if if we're not committed to them as goals then to me they shouldn't really be in the school improvement plan right they shouldn't just be a wish list item it should be something we can all get behind and so um i think we had a really great conversation about that i think we're going to see some of those changes coming uh, to future drafts so i mean i think i think some of my specific concerns were like advocate for these positions okay but that's not i mean that's advocating for something or continue using this model you know and, and then the update is we're continue continuing to use this model of, of evaluation and it just again like i said it, it's not as robust as some of the other ones and it's not it's, it's not as data driven and you know and even if it's not data driven it's just it, the idea is to look within and try to improve what is within your control not not state what you're doing or, or or ask for what you need so yes, we're, Go ahead. um thanks i can you dr Kelly? can you and, and if, if this was if this is somewhere and i missed it i apologize but does does the 2025 plan exist as a uh, uh as something that's shared with the community at this point or is it still sort of uh, in in development uh Sort of what is the status of that of that strategic planning process sure so i mean everything got sidelined because of this summer like we didn't have of our course, I, yeah. yeah no so so where it is at the moment um we've got ideas behind it we've got changes so we're, we're still in kind of the fifth year of 2021 and i was originally going to really change it up and have this be year one it's still we're still going to do 2025 basically this year of 2021 has been replaced by COVID needs, right? So it's just been so different, but we've made some big decisions and part of what we're sharing out, like we have some different big rocks, but there's a, there's much more of a focus now on equity um, across the board. And so we really have our goals around, you know, equity, teaching and learning and student services. And so what we're doing now with an administrative team you know, again, I don't have the luxury right now, two days in the summer to do this. So we're trying to figure out how to, in the middle of everything else we're trying to do, trying to update. But I do want to come out with um, more of it to share out. So when we talk about the budget process, we are talking about NRPS 2025 aligned goals and ideas. And what we've done is 
we've kept the conversation going at the administrative level so that that alignment is there. So we've aligned our goals with what's going to be in NRPS 2025. Everyone has a social justice equity goal. Everyone has a hybrid teaching and learning goal, which are, are extensions of what's going to be in the plan. And what is um, in their school improvement plans, That this is really where we're getting at. So a lot of that, as Mr. Buckley mentioned, words like continue to, that's not really a goal for improvement. That's a statement of, right? So we're trying to change the verbs and change the language to get it to say, okay, where do we want to be in, in, in five years? And where, what are we going to do this year to get there? Right. And so that's, that's really the big, the big picture plan. So there will be more like we just have for our, our review, we just updated our professional development plan. And, you know, so we've been, sprinkling bits and pieces of what's coming with NRPS 2025 there. But I feel like the bigger work to be done will be getting towards the summer is when that'll come out. Yeah, thanks. That's, that, that's good context. Um, uh, and, and of course, some of that, some of the, you know, I think we can, we can, um, you know, as we look to see what the high school is doing to, to change things up, it's some of the same efforts that we're trying to make also in our own plans. And uh, so I guess we, you know, we've all got a lot of work to do. So, uh, yeah. yeah, thanks. But the timeline was supposed to be last summer, change NRPS 2025. This year, all the school improvement plans are aligned with it. So we kind of, we still took, we still took time of our retreat for that, but it was limited time because I, you know, 90% of it had to be about reopening with COVID and everything. So it was just different than what we had originally yeah. planned. And so like hopefully when we, and I guess we'll talk about this a little bit uh, later. Are we, are, are we talking about this, the committee's uh, yes. mid-year check-in? Uh, but yeah. hopefully we can talk a little bit about how we can continue that work of referencing, being more referential to the, uh, to the, to the plan uh, as we do our goals next year, so. Yep. I think that's the transition. I mean, overall, I don't want to be negative about the plans. Overall, I think we have wonderful schools. We have wonderful students coming through the schools. But, you know, improvement plans are to improve. And so I think it's um, good to see where we're, where we're hitting it, where we're not hitting it. Um, so moving on to the school committee goals. And I'll turn it over to Dr. Daly. And I believe there's a subcommittee meeting about this. So what we've decided... Um, for this year and, and so tonight is really just to share um two documents with you I, I i don't have the school committee goals mid-year plan to share but what we came up with was similar to the format that i'm using for my goals which is similar to what other administrators use mid-cycle the question is, you're not really evaluating mid-year you're, you're evaluating whether you're on target not started or um off target right so it's it's more of a check-in mid-year to see where you are you're not coming to the point where you're evaluating with the one two three four but you're checking in to to see either what you folks have initiated or maybe through my reporting i'm telling you what um either michael's working on or sean's working on or the principals are working on or the students are working on and so the thought was to follow a very similar model to what i've shared with my goals so we would take the your goals, put them into one column, then put in some of the highlights, and then you would evaluate yourselves on, have we started, are we on target, are we off target? Because to me, what, 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 what we're looking for with my goals and with you know, teachers at this point in the year is, if you're following your plan and you're on target, keep going, and then we're gonna get there. If we're off target, that, that is a direct message to say, hey, we need to course correct and we need to come up with an adjusted plan to meet our goal. And if we haven't started yet, it's going to be, let's light that, that fire and get, and get moving. As opposed to trying to say, well, you can't really evaluate this because it's only midway through the year and we're not going to know until we get more data from the rest of the year. So that was my suggestion to the group. And I, and I think that was the idea. So we still at the end of the year would still do the one, two, three, four, where you're, where you're giving it a score. But right now, it's just a, an update on how we're doing and where we need to head. So the idea would be, you know, very soon I will get you those goals. We wouldn't review it at the next meeting. We would review it at the meeting after that. So March 22nd, I believe, is going to be the next one. It's a Monday evening again. Um, 
would be the would be the meeting that you'd review the school committee. And then my goals, I would be, I know that's coming up next. I will present those tonight. And then you would review them between now and the next meeting, which is March uh, 8th, I believe, March 4th, I'm sorry. And on March 4th, um, you would provide me with the feedback in public. So you wouldn't need to do the school committee feedback until the two meetings from that. So that's sort of the plan we came up with. Did I summarize it, Chris and Janine? Yeah, that's that's about it. Um, we'll have the, uh, the documents for both sets of evaluations available in a shared folder that uh, I'll share out for the committee members to have access to, and they'll have an opportunity to weigh in. But like Dr. Daly said, it's it, uh, it's formative, which means it's really just about thumbs up, thumbs down, and a chance to ask any questions if things need any explanations. How about instead we just put our names in a bag and we all get to pick one person to evaluate? No, I'm just kidding. Um, You'd make a great team, Mr. Buckley. There we go. <laughs> just pick one of them. You all want to evaluate me, I know. <laughs> okay, sounds good. Any any comments or actual productive comments to them? Sounds good. We'll look for it and move on to Dr. Daly's evaluation update sure so thank you so much so um I'm, I'm happy to report that i you know i i hope that you'll see that i am um at very least uh started everything <laughs> um hopefully you're going to evaluate that i'm on target so this is the actual form that you would use there there are, there's feedback here overall assessments and comments um that's where you would put some feedback and then the way i've got this set up these are the goals uh written here in the description is the goal itself and the superintendent's comments, I just listed and bulleted out um, with some direct links to, to some of the evidence that you can follow as well. And then again, you would decide at this point, am I on target, off target, or not started? And, and then um, that would continue for the student learning goal and the district improvement goals and such throughout here. So there's, there's more information here. So essentially, the way I've set this up, you could really use at this point um, just this document here as a springboard to get to the to the information. I also have updated my um, website, and so you can also go to the whoop. I must have launched the wrong page, but I've also updated the superintendent's um, website. So there's more information in the folders there as well along with the full goals. I guess I linked the same thing twice. So I'll, I'll send the link again to my um, to the website. So both of those, um, the document and the website can be explored for more, some more evidence for this point in the year. Any questions? Any comments, questions? I appreciate the evaluation subcommittee very much, honestly, because this is not how I think, so. I'm glad that somebody else is leading this. But if you uh, if, if send directions around to us how, how you want us to get feedback um, so that we can do that. And please, everybody, let's make sure we do it because I think last year we fell down on evaluation a little bit with everything happening at the end of the year. Yeah, I'll have those out um, within the next week. And I believe that you know what will happen is Mr. Private Facility will make maybe a copy of this that I won't be able to see. Um, you can add your comments and um, we discussed like some strategies. Sometimes you can just put your name in parentheses after your comments so you know it's yours or you could have a, you know, everyone could have a different color or whatnot. And then the, the subcommittee can compile the, the comments into, into one and then share them with me um, publicly at, at the next meeting. Perfect. Sound good? Okay, great. And then this again is my my mid cycle, and then I would be um, because I'm on uh, a one year cycle. I would I would have my my final submissions at the end of the school year in June into you know June July is when we would uh, finish out the year, and then I'd start the next cycle all over again. Okay, Rich. I just wanted to say uh, that I really appreciate. Dr. Daly, your commitment to this process, and I know that that's due to the fact that it's a process that you've been in, at least, uh, you know, it's, it's some 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 of the educator eval process, you know, 
been involved in, in de helping development with the state. And uh, but I just think it's your commitment to this process is great. And as uh, Scott mentioned, uh, I think hopefully our commitment to the process will be and mine. Let me let me just say my commitment to the process will be uh, uh, match yours. Uh, uh, so. Thank you. I appreciate that. I I want to extend it to all the admins and all the teachers. I mean, I've, I've changed. I've asked for more from all. I mean, I, I, I told Michael today I need one more goal, I think, or something. I mean, like, I've increased a little bit, um, but I'm trying to make sure all the admins have the same style. I made them, some of them redo it on, on a new form. I'm just trying to have that um, balance and, and try to keep it similar. We're, we're, the advantage we have right now is because of this year, everyone's working on the same plan. Everyone's on a one year plan this year. So it was a, a year to try some new, some new things, but our teachers have done a great job. Our, um, you know, we negotiated having these goals. And then when, when the plan came out from the state, it was almost as if they'd read our minds. So we're definitely in line. Our, our teachers, non-professional status have submitted their, um, their formative goals. I mean, despite everything that everyone's going through, they're still working on this and, and they're buying into that idea that I truly believe in, which is, if you know, if we identify these as goals and we and we have meaningful goals, yes, there's some work associated with with sharing it, but it's time well spent because being reflective and stepping back and evaluating it it, it gives you that energy to do all these things that we have to do and to get that feedback. If you do it well and you get good feedback, it puts you on the right path to do great things, and and that's what you know my my administrative team. I'm I'm so impressed. I, I just want to share like they. They have team goals, and I, I just love – you know, I, I, I'll, I'll say, hey, can we meet Tuesday after school? And they'll say, oh, we can't. That's our, our team goal when we're all meeting to discuss the, the, the social justice curriculum that we're looking at or the, or the book that we're reading. I mean, it's, it's really great seeing them living out and really, you know, um, enacting these goals and, and making this a part of what they do every day because it's so easy to be overwhelmed right now. But I think this focus on the goals is helping everyone stay connected to a steady path to, to, to success. So I just want to thank everyone for their work. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, I think we, we were, yeah, we all can, all can do better this year. I mean, he, even people that got comments in and we were, we extended them, we were later, we pushed things back in meetings. So we need to not do that. Um, random question, which is somewhat related to this topic, but I know that we built in, um, time for all the all the staff to work together kind of in the elementary wednesday afternoons in the high school middle school in the mornings do, do, do people find that that time is 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 necessary is being used well i mean how, how is that time going i i would say i mean i haven't surveyed officially but i would say it's um you know anecdotally it's very well received and very positive I don't know how they would do it without it. I, I'm sure it's what you'd hear because um, not only are they, they're still conducting uh, professional development about digital learning and tools. That's where they're doing a lot of sharing. That's where they're, they're um, you know, they're coming together to plan, um, to think out ideas about what worked well for you. How did it work in hybrid? How did it work with kids that were home? Um, what can I do to improve sharing tips and tricks? Quite honestly, every year, you know, one of the biggest things we always talk about in education is more times for per, uh, for professional collaboration um, among grade levels, among departments. You know, during during the day, because people have prep times, which is part of their contract. But those preps, because of when they're able to be scheduled, they're not often times that um, are able to be scheduled with other people doing the same thing in order to be productive, which. When I talk to people that are in other businesses, that's unheard of, right? Because you say, we're going to have a meeting. You bring everyone to the meeting that needs to be there, that's working on the same project, and they're, and they're working on it. With, with education, you imagine that board meeting where you bring everyone together, but five of the people can't be there because they've got a class of 25 kids to be with, right? So trying to find ways to do that um, are, are incredibly important. So I think it was a great thing we were able to build into this schedule this year and quite honestly it's one of the things that i'm hoping we can re-emerge from this and say this is one of those things we want to try and keep somehow some way um, if we can look at our schedule and part of as we look at our our 
our calendar for next year and our, our start times and our the way we're constructing our days, if there's some way to preserve some of this collaboration in some way, I think it'd be fantastic. Even if we have to be a little bit outside the box where um, you know, it, it's a few minutes here or there that we can combine um, at certain points in order to, to achieve that, I think that's definitely something to work for. So long answer to your question, but it's very important. No, it's good. It's good to hear. I mean, I, I, I was thinking about that the other day about how useful it is if people are, are using it as, as, as was originally intended, if they're finding other, other uses for it. So happy to hear. I noticed in the school improvement plan the call out to the uh, early start times too, which I liked seeing. Um, so <clears throat> good. Okay, we'll move on to routine matters. No minutes this week. So you know what that means. We get extra minutes another week. So exciting stuff to look forward to. Um, Budget update, Mr. Connolly, turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Mr. Buckley. So in your packet this evening was the budget report that summarizes financial activity through the end of January. Um, again, I, I, there's not a lot of new information or new drivers in terms of the general fund with, um, with the budget report this week. A lot of what I've previously reported in terms of the additional expenses that we incurred for um, certainly related to COVID-19 for supplies, equipment, technology, software, uh, devices, some HVAC upgrades, um, et cetera, uh, you know, continue to be uh, the case. We've gotten into sort of a good flow and, and, and a good process and established some good relationships and gotten a really good, good hands on um, you know, you know the needs in this area in terms of you know sanitation and, and PPE and, and so forth. So that all continues to go well. Um, and despite many of these unexpected costs that have occurred, um, you know we've been able to to make those adjustments, leverage the the variety of sources of either federal or state um, grants that have been allocated to the district for um, to address specific expenses related to the pandemic and um, really make good use of those funds from a both uh, technology standpoint, health and sanitation standpoint, cleaning standpoint, um, and, and really hired some, some staffing in certain areas, as you are aware, um, that have made a significant impact. So that all continues to go well. Uh, we, we continue to be in, despite um, you know, the new costs, because we've leveraged the additional funding that has been made available, um, in, in solid financial standing. Um, there are some balances that continue to be there on the payroll side that I've previously reported. I've, we've talked about the balance in the administration line item because of delay in hiring the assistant superintendent of teaching and learning. That, that was uh, not a surprise that was expected. Um, there's some balances in the special education um, paraprofessional line item. Just There's just been... Um, some leave of absence that have occurred and, and other hiring and needs and so forth that have just led to uh, additional you know, turnover and attrition savings in, 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 in that area. Um, there's some projected balance in the special education transportation line item, just less students retransporting, less hours, less overtime, all related to that account that have led to some projected savings in that area. Uh, but overall, I think things are going well. Uh, the, the, the new parts of this report does speak to specifically to some new areas of funding that have been recently identified in uh, for COVID-19. Um, and that was included on the, the final page of the report, uh, financial data. Um, we recently were notified of a new funding called the Prevention Fund State Program. Um, this would allocate $74,500 to the school district that are funds that was specifically a state, state allocation kind of earmarked through the state budget that would specifically need to be spent by June 30, 2021. Uh, the funds can be spent but are not limited on some of the following areas, PPE, um, sanitation supplies, costs associated with ensuring socially distance on-site learning, uh, remote learning needs um, to successfully continue to implement your, your hybrid learning approach, 
Um, so all areas certainly related to the pandemic and to COVID-19 um, is there, but it's certainly a, an influx of 74,500 that we have not, did not expect or did not anticipate. We do have a short window of time, but certainly Dr. Daly and myself and the administration, you know, we, we definitely can find the needs and we've been talking about where, where those funds can be spent, but it would all be related to continuing the, the hybrid model, ensuring the the technology is there, ensuring ensuring the the um, the health and safety supplies are there. You know any any expenses that potentially could arise based on any of the, the testing programs that we've spoken about. There'll be some a funding source there to to address it, which is which is a, a, all all positive news. And, and every every state, every district in the state received a, an allocation of funding at a fixed amount pure pure pupil. Um, as well as an additional amount for their low income or economically disadvantaged student population. So for North Reading, it led to $74,500. Um, we did receive, although we were anticipating this amount, uh, what is known as our SR2 uh, allocation, which has a much larger window of funding, um, which we can be spent through September 30th of uh, fiscal year uh, 2000, or September 30th of 2023, so it go, actually goes all the way into fiscal year 24. So those are areas of funding that we hope to be able to secure for fiscal 22 and fiscal 23 to continue services that we feel are priority that have become kind of a new way of, of doing business in, a, in this environment for technology and for um, teaching and learning and, and so forth, that uh, certainly health and safety that we hope to be able to continue and, and budget and offset with the use of these funds in the two subsequent fiscal years. So you'll be hearing more about that when we talk about the, the fiscal year 22 budget. But certainly Dr. Daly and I have been talking to the budget subcommittee about the use of some of these funds as well. So overall, I think we're, again, I think we're in, in pretty solid financial standing, but you can see on the report, um, pretty healthy projected balance. You know, certainly things are going to come up. There'll be some unanticipated costs. We have, we have, you know, several months to go. Um, but I think we're in in good standing. Not all of those journal entries uh, or transfers from the the town uh, funding that five hundred and forty eight thousand two eighty two have occurred. So you still see that reflected on the report. Um, and we're hoping that. It, as soon as the town completes that process with the state, that 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 will be able to happen in the near future. Um, so that that's there's a couple other things related to the budget update tonight, but that's kind of the the fiscal 22 report. I, I'll open it up to any questions before I move on to the next topic. Well, only question I had, Mike, and and I forget this, but did we ever get that dairy grant or not? I don't know if you ever told us that. Uh, good question. Uh, we did not get that dairy grant, unfortunately. Um, we were notified that, again, it's the competitive nature of that grant. Um, you know, we unfortunately were not not chosen. Um, so that, you know, that was unfortunate. We were able to kind of allocate some of that 548,282, uh, as well as that reopening grant. Um, you know, to to food services to and to help to help that area, um, but unfortunately, we we fell short of receiving that grant. Uh, we continue to look for grants in that area. The state, the, the to the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, they did release a, a what's known as a food service equipment grant, um, for for the purchase of specific equipment related to addressing. The COVID-19 um, pandemic and need, new needs, uh, equipment needs to maintain it in a, a safe, safe program. So we did, um, you know, purchase some equipment. We purchased a new sealer. We, you know, there's other equipment we could need. So we did apply for, um, for that grant, and we did get confirmation that they're reviewing that application. And that we could be scheduled for an interview or additional information. So that was about a fourteen thousand dollar grant specifically geared towards equipment purchasing. Um, so we were hopeful maybe we'll have good news there. Thank you. Great. Um, the second thing I just want to talk about, um, I do want to talk about the bus contract. Before I go on to that, I do, I do want to just update a couple other uh, small budget related areas. Um, 
I just wanted to announce publicly that I did post a, a budget video, the first budget video for fiscal 22. The, the state, uh, the governor released his, his budget at the end of January. Um, and I did do some of chapter 70 analysis of that, of the governor's budget and, and what that means for North Reading as we typically do at this time. Um, and that was about a 20 minute video that, that was made and it is posted and shared on the website. So um, I encourage anyone that's interested, kind of check, check that out. It's similar to what, similar uh, topics and themes, trends than what we've dis discussed in the past at this time. But I did want to kind of discuss that publicly. Um, and I also want to mention that the, the administration, myself and Dr. Daly, over the next really day or so, we'll be putting the finishing touches on the preliminary fiscal year 22 kind of superintendent recommended budget. Uh, we got some good feedback tonight um, with the budget subcommittee as well as last week or a week and a half ago. So we, I do plan as scheduled to have those budget books dropped off um, or get those budget books to the school committee this week. Um, so I'll, I'll plan on doing that. Okay. Um, and the next topic was, I did want to discuss the, the bus contract. So, so included in your packet was the pricing information and a little short memo of myself that talks about some of, some of the options I feel like we have going forward with the bus contract for next year. So the bids were received on January 28th. Um, since the last meeting, and I think we met on January 28th, so I didn't have a lot of time to go through the bids in detail. So since then, we, we have had the time to do that. Um, so I did put the pricing bid tabulation together for your review. Um, we received two bids, uh, the, the current contractor, North Reading Transportation, or NRT, um, as they're called, um, and the previous contractor, North Suburban Transportation, came back and submitted a bid as well. So the, the pricing tabulation that was included includes both the three-year pricing as well as the alternate bid, which we asked for in the bid specification, which is a three-year, two-year option pricing, so the, the, a five-year bid. So you can see in the several different categories and for regular kindergarten and extracurricular field trip, um, the pricing and how that compares towards our current pricing, which is in the far left column in, in the table. Um, so I think we have a several options. It's, it's not as clear cut um, as some of these sometimes this is. It's not a clear, um, decisive kind of low bid or, or advantageous option here. Um, North Suburban, I think, I think, well, first, I think it's important to know, as I said in the memo, um, because of how we have structured the bid specification, we've always kind of asked for a three-year contract, which is typically what we're able to do. Um, cities and towns have the ability to kind of go out and, and get the authority through their governing body to for transportation to go as high as five years. And we, ha we have done that, did that several years ago. So we do have the option to, to go into a five-year contract without bidding or as long as five years without rebidding. So we've always kind of asked for that three to two year option pricing as well. Um, but what's important to note is because, because of how this bid has, was structured and because of what is um, required by the procurement laws in Massachusetts under chapter 30B, uh, when we decide and determine the rule for award is we're essentially trying to find who's the most resp responsive and responsible bidder. And we can only calculate that award on the guaranteed years of that contract. So we're really calculating that on, on the pricing for the first three years. Um, you know, I, even though I think in previously we've gone out as long as five years and haven't rebid, uh, because of the current bid specs, though that fourth and fifth year was clearly optional, um, we can't necessarily make a, uh, you know, use the fourth and fifth year in the calculation to determine the the low bid. Um, so I think that's an important distinction here because as you can see, North Suburban is the clear low bidder for the, for the first three years, and then their pricing tends to go up. And NRT is, if we were to go five years, it, they are the, the, the low bidder. 
Um, so because of the requirements and how the bid was structured, we really have a few different options here as I've laid out in the memo. The first option is we can award the bid to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, which in this case would be North Suburban in their three-year contract. That would require us to, you know, a little over two years from now as we approach um, the end of the three years, we'd have to go back out to bid um, at that point if we were to go that direction. Now, North Suburban, we, we are considering North Suburban a responsible and responsive bidder. Um, they do meet the minimum requirements. They do. I did check references. The references were were solid, um, and they've proven that they've their equipment meets the specifications. They would have GPS. They would have cameras. They would work with us on those areas, um, and they would they do meet the requirements. So I, I don't think we can consider them kind of a non-responsive or responsible bidder. So they would be the the low bid for the three years uh, because they're the low bidder. We do have the option to kind of negotiate with that low bidder. Uh, so we could negotiate the, those optional fourth and fifth years with them. We could say, look, are you able to, to work with us on the fourth and fifth year if we opt to go five years That's in, um, without bidding because they're the low bidder? What we can't do is then is turn to NRT and say, NRT, can you match you know, North Suburban's first three years and then we'll kind of stay with you? That would be a violation. Uh, because NRT is not the the calculated low bid in in the rule for award, which is the first three years of the contract. Um, uh, the third option is we could reject all bids and say, you know, we, we're not happy with the options on the table. We really like the option to to go to five years and North Suburban, although they're very attractive in the first three, because they're so much higher in fourth and fifth. Um, we want to kind of you know, reject all the bids, go back out, maybe clarify some of that language. That would give us the opportunity to to clarify the rule for award and and, and say and almost bid out a, a guaranteed five year and a guaranteed three year, which would give us that that option to to maybe rule um, from the from the outright or to include the fourth and fifth year in the the award calculation. Uh, it could also give us the option to look at some of the language and make any changes and to you know offer requesting samples of of their camera system or samples of their gps software and a little bit more information to make sure we're entirely comfortable with all the specifications um and and go back out we have time to do that because it's it's not april or may it's 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 the beginning of february and we could complete this process in about three weeks time um so that option is still on on the table what would happen though if we should exercise that option is that would completely disqualify this bid so we couldn't then say look we don't like we rebid it the pricing comes back a little bit different a little bit higher we we'll say oh we're going to go back to the bid that was due january 28th that would completely make this bid um null and void um so the risk there is should both bidders come back or one bidder decide not to bid or one now we only get one bid and and should that pricing be higher for whatever reason we would we, kind of be stuck with that pricing uh we couldn't go back to the the pricing on this bid so that would be a risk um you know I, I don't it's hard to say what would happen i don't think that would happen i think i think we got very competitive pricing here by both bidders so i think we're certainly working with two very motivated companies that that want to either one to either win back our business and one to maintain it um because based on the market research I've done, the going rate for next year really is around three hundred and ninety dollars, and we're really looking at pricing either three sixty or three sixty eight. When you look at the the big yellow bus contract, so I think we got some some two two very highly motivated, very competitive pricing. Um, you know, both bids just both companies just kind of chose to approach it a little bit of a different way in terms of um, looking at the three and the five year option. So. Um, it's good to have options, but I don't think it's as clear cut as sometimes this situation is. is. So, um, you know, I, I I'm definitely intrigued by by the North Suburban bid. You know, the three the three hundred and sixty dollar price is very good. It would actually be um, almost cheaper when you look at what's in the general fund. Take away take out the charters and the athletics, but you look at the kindergarten run and the F, and the regular run. Um, it almost would be cheaper than what we're paying now for next year. It obviously gets gets more expensive as you go, 
um, but but there would be a, a level of saving. So right, NRT, like, on, on yeah. that one, on that one thought, one thing that wasn't on here that I just did when you were talking, I just added up a comparison of year five of the current contract versus year one of North Suburban. And it looks like overall year one goes down about $11,000. It looks like we're paying. Must, correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, like so, okay. yeah, we go from about seven hundred and sixty thousand to about seven hundred and forty-nine thousand in year one of North Suburban's current bid. Yes, so there would be a savings. I think I think the general fund impact a little over seven thousand, but then there could be other savings as you get into the charters and the field trips and and so forth. So, um, yeah, so it's very it's very attractive. It's very competitive pricing um, for North Suburban because yeah, you would be able to reduce the general fund and even even save in some extracurricular areas in that first year. Um, you know, the drawback, the only drawback, is I think we, we essentially, if, if they're unable to negotiate in, in, or um, with us, and that gets tricky, and, you know, that they may not be open to that, then we, we would be putting it back out to bid a couple of years from now and be, be sort of, you know, risk where the market is at that time. Is it a lot higher? Is it a lot different, you know, two, two and a half years from now? Um, but certainly, certainly a very highly motivated um, bid by North Suburban. Okay, thank you, Mike. Um, thoughts, comments? I mean, Diana and I were in the budget subcommittee. I don't know if you want to kind of, I mean, I don't know if Diana wants to maybe start with thoughts because we were talking about that before. No, I mean, I mean, I'm happy to, when we were talking through this, I think, the North suburban higher, you know, later years were of concern. And so, um, you know, but the beginning of that, that first three years looks, looks really great. So it's, you know, it's certainly something to consider and to possibly go back to them on. It's kind of where I stand. Yeah. I mean, I think, and I think that's sort of the conclusion I came from, from our conversation. Diana asked some questions. Diana asked some good questions in the subcommittee about, you know, about evaluating the different companies. And, you know, Michael was good about saying North Suburban, North Suburban, we were with for a very long time. And it's just the last contract that we went over to NRT. And we had a long, good history with North Suburban. There were some bumps in the road the last year or two, if I'm stating it correctly. And Michael said that, you know, NRT had some bumps in the road in the first couple of years. They've gotten better. But you know, we have a history with both of these. It seems like North Suburban wants to win our business back. And most of the districts that they seem to work with are, are directly around us, Linfield, Reading, Woburn. And so it probably makes a lot of sense for them geographically. I think it's really hard to pass up a reduction in the busing costs, um, you know, over three years. If we can get them to negotiate it, it Again, I, I think it's a slam dunk if we could get them to lower years four and five, which are optional anyways. Um, you know, if we could do that, I think that's where I would also stand. The only other th point I would make is I never even thought about this, but we talk about uh, half day kindergarten and full day kindergarten a lot. And you see how much we're paying for busing just for that mid midday run. If we were to have full day kindergarten, we could eliminate that as well. So there's actually a cost savings that I never even thought about about adding in full day kindergarten and when you see how few people choose half day kindergarten it's like it's so hard it's so hard that we uh do that but that's another point but you know rich chris janine I, I'm, I'm curious about your thoughts about the busing uh, i'll chime in i think that uh i think that i agree that the the uh the three year number is pretty attractive. Um, I'm curious, Michael, what you think of is the sort of opportunity cost of having to implement a new, I know they were worked with us before, but you know, there's always a, an, I would assume there's an extra effort in, in uh, establishing, you know, a new company onto the roots uh, over the course of the summer. And um, just curious what that effort is and if it's, um, I mean, not that you can guarantee, no matter, even if we go back, go back, you know, redo the bid, there, you can't guarantee you wouldn't have to do this anyway, but I'm just curious what that effort is like and whether, whether that's yeah. a consideration that we should be thinking about. Yeah, that's a, it's a great question. Um, and there certainly would be, um, work involved in that as, as we went through 
you know, about five years ago when we made the switch over to, to NRT. It certainly involves several kind of transitional meetings um, and kind of getting, you know, I think, it, I think, I think we had some pretty good drivers five, five, six years ago. I think it's safe to assume and I, that most of those drivers, you know, have moved on to other things. We wouldn't, we, we wouldn't have those drivers back that were driving in North, in, in um, North Reading for North, with North Suburban, you know, five, five years ago. Um, so there would be a transition there. Typically what happens when you make a contract change is you do kind of a kickoff meeting with the group involved, um, their dispatch office, uh, the terminal manager, um, the, you know, the owner, and, and you talk about some things that are important and, and, and how that transition is going to work. And then typically what you do is, is that you kind of, you kind of give the opportunity for the drivers. And this does happen. This is standard to, to potentially make the change over and switch companies. So that I believe that does happen more than you would think. Um, and Typically, we kind of offer a an optional meeting for the current drivers to come to an informational session held by you know myself with members of North, you know the, the other company there to answer questions to so they can make an informed decision for themselves whether they want to continue you know driving the same route that they're used to and, and make the switch with the new company. Um, you know, sometimes members of their HR HR office come and answer questions. So we did that five years ago. I would say only one driver made the switch, um, and I don't know what the re the the result of that would be now, um, but that would most likely occur. And um, and I think the impact of that is if you don't have a lot of the current drivers that know the route, that have get very accustomed with how we operate, with how we want the routes driven, with the children, the stops, you know, the different the different ins and outs of it. Is you typically do go through some growing pains on a switchover for that that first few months. There's the, things are a little bumpy, you know, runs take a little bit longer. You might get a little bit some missed bus stops. Then more than you, there's more than more than usual. There's a that, there's a little bit of bumps in the road, and then they iron themselves out generally. And I, I think both these companies can do the job, but they would do the job. They would they won't be perfect. I don't think any bus company is perfect. Um, there'll be some issues along the road, but I think early on next next fall, we would see more of those by making a change than we wouldn't. And I you know, I think a company like North Suburban would would figure it out pretty quickly, but there would certainly be some some growing pains because you're dealing with with probably at least fifty percent of the drivers would be new. Um, I would say um, so that would be typical. Um, and then you know I think potentially I, we we don't what's unforeseen right now is what would some of the the tiers look like are there any changes are the start and end times the same or different and so that that could cause a little bit of a disruption or uh, um as well so i think you're going to go through that a little bit to an extent in the fall um so i think we'd work through those but that that would be typical so certainly a little bit extra effort kind of going through that transition reacclimating the the company to the district um i think our expectations are so much higher quite honestly than they were five or six years ago with busing, and I've tried to make that clear um, when I did have some conversations to clarify some some of the documents in the bid with North Suburban that you know we you know GPS is very important to us. We didn't we didn't even have GPS the last time North Suburban was here. Can't, workable cameras that are reliable that will show four or five areas of the bus um, is essential, and that that was like optional five years ago. And um, so it's just, you know, the, the expectation, you know, we're, we're looking at rolling out some apps and some portals and, and different things is, is that much higher. And um, so there'd, there'd, be some, there'd be some additional work and some growing pains. I don't think it's anything that we can't overcome or work through, certainly. But it's, a, it's a definitely a good question. I'll, I'll add in just because I mentioned the current contract goes from about, is about 760000 and the North Suburban first year would be about seven forty nine. North Reading Transportation or NRT would go up to seven eighty six, so it'd be about twenty six thousand dollars more right. versus eleven thousand yeah. dollars less. Um, yeah. And I'll just say that I remember when I was running for school committee, I think the trans the transition from North Suburban Suburban to NRT just happened. And I, I remember a number of parents had said to me they were disappointed because they really liked North Suburban. Yeah. And overall, I just I I believe in the bidding process and. I I I don't want to 
don't know. Again, I, I believe in the bidding process, and I worry that like if you don't take the low bid and you finagle it or whatever, that you don't get future bids in the you know later uh, on if you play with the process too much. I would agree. I would agree with. I mean, I think that's a, a very uh, fair statement. I think you. you know, I think it's the bid process exists for a reason, and I think it does work. It does make it competitive, and um, and I think I res I think you need to respect the process and um, as well. I, I I would I would agree. Yeah, I mean, and again, uh, four four and five we can ask for different because that that's not part of the bid, but um, yeah. Rich? I was going to say it was only it's only that it's only that that the the sort of bifurcated result that uh, even brings that into question is the fact that it's three years is favored in one side and, and five years is favored the other side right yeah. but uh, yeah but I, I i i agree with you on the bid process i mean i yeah. I, I i don't my i guess i guess i can say that i don't think we should rebid so i mean i think we yeah. should. i i came into the day not knowing what i kind of saying maybe we just go back but you know when i really looked at like the three years you know i'm like worst comes to worst we rebid it in three years but um you know, and again, if we say to them, like, look, we're going to rebid this in three years, but we'd really like you to consider something else for four and five. Um, but Chris and Ginny, and I know if you guys want to have any thoughts as well, welcome them. Yeah. Um, you know, this this conversation just now is kind of what, what I was going to ask about. Uh, are there any reasons we shouldn't go um, and see if they can change their four and five year Plan, but it sounds like that doesn't cost us anything to check in with North Suburban about that. Uh, is that right, Mr. Connolly? Yes, that's correct. So I can certainly have that conversation and, I, and let them know that that's something we would be kind of interested in and, and seeing if that's something they're they're open to. I'd more than likely they would be. Um, they certainly want the business um, to see if they're willing to kind of negotiate and work with us in those optional years as as the official low bid of this of this contract. Yeah. I, I, I kind of imagine that given the last year and how things have gone, that uh, these companies would prefer to have some sort of long-term stability they can bank on. Um, that's just how it's, but we'll see. Yeah. I mean, and would, that never lock in, would that lock in the, the, the two years though? Is that what we'd be giving up is, is the optionality? Um, I don't think you would be giving that up. I just think if, I think what you would say is if, you know, if we get when we get to that, you know, midway through that third year, um, you know, are you, are you willing to to come down on your optional years? And then if if they are, that would get kind of that would get known at that time. And then if if you go if you do decide to exercise that that option, then you would be dealing with that that revised price at that time. And I think, uh, Rich, I I think what it would be saying is. I think what you would say is like, look, we we appreciate your bid, we like your bid. You know, the only hesitation in accepting it is, you know, we like the idea of having an option in year four and five that, even though they're not mandated, would be something that we can plan for. You know, and and don't really love the idea of going out again in two two and a half in two years again. And you know, I think we like the option. We we like we like the bid that you put in, but. You know, I think it would be a little bit easier to accept and not, you know, look for other bids if, you know, if, if four and five were a little bit better. Because some of the discussion that happened was, do we want to only do a three-year contract or do we want to do a five-year contract? And, you know, I think since we did a three-year, we like it. But, again, that's where I'm having trouble saying yes to it is just because even year four, I mean, it's only $10 a bus more than, you know, NRTs there. It's just like that fifth year at it's thirty dollars more, and it's like maybe we do a thirty dollar jump in year four, but I mean a sixty dollar jump over two years is pretty steep. Janine, your hands up. Mike, um, why didn't North Suburban um, bid five years ago? Because was uh, it NRT the only one? No, no suburban bid five years ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, five years ago, um, NRT was significantly cheaper, and that was that was the big difference. Um, so, yeah, NRT it, NRT was significantly the lower. So that that was kind of the the main reason for the change at that time. 
for some reason I thought there was just that one bid that came in. That's why I was wondering. Yeah, no, we, we did get the two bids five years ago. And I, and I remember it was a pretty sizable difference in price at the time. I think, I think it had a lot to do with the equipment acquisition. I think it was because of the, the specifications were requiring the equipment to be of a certain age. NRT happened to have some in stock that met those requirements. North Suburban didn't. North Suburban was going to have to go back out and purchase new, bu new buses to meet the specs. And I think NRT was able to really undercut and be much more competitive because they, they had some in stock. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Okay. <clears throat> Do we... <clears throat> So if, if uh, again, I don't know if we have a consensus here or not, we can kind of talk, but if the consensus is we don't really want to bid the whole thing again, we like North Suburban's three-year bid, but we don't really want to just accept it right now. We want to see if maybe they could get something better for four and five. Would we want to do a motion on that or would we want to just push it back to you, Mike, to have that conversation and then maybe address it at the next school committee meeting? Um, yeah, I mean, we can make a, either a motion with either with a condition that, um, you know, that, that I look to, uh, you know, negotiate the, the optional fourth and fifth year, um, to reduce that pricing or match that of NRT or, um, and then if that, if that is, you know, if that is accepted, then, you know, move forward with the award or, um, or we can, you know, just authorize me to go back, have that conversation, and then we can we can bring it up at the next meeting. Is there a deadline for accepting these bids? So we have 60 days. So okay. the, the, we have plenty of time. The one thing I would say is if we were going to eventually uh, at some point rebid, I, I would want to get that bid out by, by early March. So I, you know, I think the next meeting is March 4th. So there's, there's a few weeks in between. Which it would, be, which it would be okay if we had to wait then, but I would want to get it out, you know, that week. Michael, given the fact that we're looking at uh, sending you back to them, which way would you prefer that we handle it? I, I think it was, if you're okay making like a uh, making a motion with like a conditional acceptance, with the understanding that I'm able to to get or achieve um, flexibility to, for for uh, revised, you know, reduced pricing in the optional years. And and for the committee, I mean, do we, is that what we're sort of thinking? I don't know, I, that, that's what I'm thinking, that's where my head's at, but I don't know. I can't see Diane on screen. I can see Rich and Chris nodding. Yeah, I would agree with that. I, I can see myself. I don't know why you guys can't see me. Um, my camera's on, but yes, I agree. Yep. When it's pinned, you can only see four, and so it just oh, rotates. Right. 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 Um, Janine, were you sort of nodding as well? I'm okay to go with the three year in with the condition that, you know, if he can get mm -hmm. them to maybe come down on years four and five, but even if they don't, then you still can go out to bid. So that's correct. correct. I'm good. Yeah. I mean, I think ultimately if you rebid it, you're hoping that NRT comes down a little bit, but you know, again, then, then you're tinkering with the, with the process. And we, we were fortunate enough to get two bids the last two times we went out to bid. And so I don't know that you really want to favor one over the other. It's a free market and we were and these, are, and these are good bids. They're yeah. good bids. They're, they're yeah. Good, com good companies. I mean, you know, with, within the context and their uh, and their their below. I mean, fr frankly, Michael, it sounds like you're saying they're below where you where it seemed like the market was going. Correct. Yeah. So. Most most districts in this region that have either gone out to bid recently or last year, or, you know, we're actually ahead. Most districts. I know Reading and is going out, ha needs to go back out to bid. I think. They're they're seeing pricing in that three ninety on average range for next year. So, yeah. What's the what's the difference? I don't, I don't, I don't get it. But. Yeah. Well, do you, do you think the way that we handle things? I mean, in the way that you advocated us handling things, Michael, do you think that helped? Um, I like 
I'd like to like to think that might be the case, certainly. <laughs> but I, I, think, I think just I think we had two highly motivated bidders uh, that um, you know that certainly you know one certainly wanted to to, to maintain and, and continue working and servicing North Reading, and the other that had been here for a long time, you know, was highly motivated to come back and 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 get back with the with the district. So sometimes that that works out. Yeah, I mean, I mean it's a pretty uh, it, in addition to uh, a, a great uh, business, uh, you know, assistant uh, superintendent to work with. Um, it's a, you know, it must be a pretty compact and, and manageable uh, piece of business, North Reading. It's, you know, it's, yeah, it's not sprawling. It's not, it's, uh, it's pretty easy to manage, I would think, in, in that sense. Mm -hmm. Well, and, and also you have to understand that some schools might not even be open in the fall still. I mean, we've had, we've had bus service yeah. from day yeah. one. And, you know, even when we were closed in the spring, we were paying them. And, so I think I think all that goes into it. I mean, we we talked about that last year. We talked about, you know, we did have a bus contract coming up, and you know, Michael was the biggest advocate for treating people fairly and making sure that we could keep the bus drivers for this year. And so I think, um, you know, working with him has again his leadership in this. I think we he he gets a lot of the credit for you know good companies wanting to bid bid on our on our work. So we appreciate it, Michael. Thank you. Okay, so do we want to do a motion to approve the? Yep. Yeah. Go ahead, Rich. You want to make a motion? I will try to do that. I will move that the school committee uh, uh, vote to award the regular transportation contract to North Suburban Transportation uh, from July. Well, I guess um, uh, from from July twenty one twenty from July 1, 2021 to June 30, 2024, contingent upon uh, Mr. Connolly uh, going back to them and uh, ne negotiating on the final, on the year four and five on the contract. Yeah. Sounds good. Second. Okay. Is there any further comment? We'll take a vote on this. Rich? Aye. Diana? Aye. Janine? Aye. Aye. Chris? Aye. I'm an I as well. Thank you very much, Michael. It was Thank you. Good leadership on this. I mean, I, I yeah, they're both great, great bids. And, and please, yeah, good news. You know, we ultimately do that. I mean, express our gratitude for NRT for everything they've done. But I mean, ultimately, it's a bidding process. We're a, we're a public entity. And so we really can't, I mean, we can't justify spending an additional thirty-seven thousand dollars next year versus you know he, he knows the deal. yeah he budgets knows. are tight right. so, yeah yep. well right. thank you everyone good good comments thank you okay <clears throat> moving on we are on to staffing no update correct dr daly none at this time uh no bids and donations <clears throat> subcommittee updates policy subcommittee Chris Janine, and we saw some of the fruits of your labor today. Anything else? That's that's all we have to update on. Excellent evaluation. We saw some of your updates as well. <laughs> Anything on this? Uh, yeah, as I alluded to earlier, you'll be uh, um, seeing a shared folder uh, populate shortly, and there will be instructions in that. Finance planning team. Rich, any thoughts on the last one? Uh, not really. You 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 might have more but uh, it was a brief uh, just a quick update on revenues yeah i mean revenue giveth and taketh they you know the state aid came up a little bit but then they lowered new growth which i always find convenient but um that, that's a projection that, that that they make and i don't know i mean that's kind of where we're at and what were the updates at the end? There was a couple of updates at the end. They were talking a little bit about the vaccination rollout, which was nice. And um, I feel like there was something else, but I don't know if it was pertinent. Yeah, once again, they're ready. They're ready if they can get the vaccines. They're ready to go. So, yeah. Um, in the budget subcommittee, we just had before this. Um, as you as you heard, you're gonna we're gonna be prepared to send the budget out in the next week. And I think oh, I, I had a question on that. Are, are, are you going to, uh, Michael? Are you planning on doing uh, paper copies, or are you just going to send a big PDF? Yeah, I can. I can do both. I mean, I did prepare a handful of paper copies, assuming 
just as, I'm assuming some folks certainly like to kind of work with the binder and the paper copy, make notes, but I can, I can, um, I can do both. I can send it out electronically. And then if, if someone wants to let me know if they prefer a, a binder paper copy, I can have one delivered as well. Um, I'm so, a paper person when it comes to a file that large. So if you don't yeah, mind. <laughs> absolutely. I, don't, I, I'm, I definitely, I've already actually, I've been preparing to make at least, at least five or five or six. So I can definitely get those out. Yeah. I'd like a paper copy. I, I, I would actually like both. I kind of figured the, the committee, kind of all of us the, would prefer probably both. And then I think for eventually for other members, you know, finance committee, finance planning team will probably go the, the electronic route and, and save some, save some paper. That makes so sense. really small print for them too. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I don't think there's anything else in budget. Subcommittee schedule. Finance planning team is meeting on March 2nd at 8 a.m. Athletic subcommittee is meeting March 17th at 1 p.m. Fine arts subcommittee is meeting March 17th at 3.30 p.m. Administrative report, Dr. Daly. So I just wanted to share some great news that, as you know, we have the uh, Charles E. Jones Excellence in Education Award this year. It's going to be presented on February 12th at 9.01 to 9.30 a.m. And that's very, from my understanding, Charlie Jones time to start at 9.01 or, you know, not on an exact um, 9 o'clock or 9.30. So I wanted to just uh, share. We had tremendous uh, response from students, staff, families that, that nominated folks this year. just wanted to share some of the, the great nominees that came in. Uh, Whitney Cleary from the Hood School. Andy Dexter from North Reading High School, Jolene Danian from North Reading Middle School, Kelly Gilbert from North Reading High School, Carla Lister from North Reading Middle School, Heather Maiola from North Reading Middle School, Audra Majewski from the Hood School, Phil Knackley from the Little School and also spends time at NRHS, uh, Tracy Nicholas, our nurse at North Reading High School, Kelly Olson at North Reading High School, and Andrea Slavin from the Hood. Uh, but this year's uh, winner is Miss Allison Kane from North Reading High School. So it's a um, really, really excellent um, group of, of finalists here. And it, there's a wonderful um, video that I'll try to share with everyone that uh, of the Masker students that nominated uh, Miss Kane, kind of presenting her and, and just sharing the great news. It's really quite a tribute. So. Um, I will be sharing uh, that. We'll probably record that video and also share it out. Um, but we're really excited to celebrate. Um, you know, and, and it's one of those things in a, in a year where there are so many challenges. It's it's great to take some time and, and celebrate excellence. So we're really excited about that. Is that going to be an in-person celebration or a, or a link? It's going to be a link. Um, I can share that out. Um, with folks ahead of time, it's going to be, um, so again, one of the nice benefits, getting more folks there. Um, Mrs. Kane, um, the high school administration, I will be there. Mr. Votto, last year's recipient, um, will be able to be there in person and a few guests, um, internal guests. But unfortunately, we can't get into having extended family and, and uh, Miss Brown and some of Mr. Jones's family aren't able to come in person, but they are going to try and join live and to share as well. So it'll be a nice interactive um, ceremony. We're going to set up um, right outside of Charles E. Jones Way, right there in the Main Street Middle School area. So I think it's a a great award uh, celebrating a, a great educator in North Reading, and I think Miss Kane is a embodiment of everything that the the award stands for. So. Yeah, if you could share that link out, I mean, I, I went last year. I don't. I was up there for something. Um, I it looks like I might have a meeting at the time, so I might not be able to go. But if I can, I'd love to pop in. Sure. Yeah, we last year was the same day as the blue ribbon uh, ceremony at the little school. So, um, so we kept this going. We we went back and forth. We said, are we going to do it in the spring when we could be outside? But we felt like. You know, I think the the group that's met several times, uh, led by uh, Claudia Brown, just felt this was a great time to celebrate um, in, in the middle of the year and give some light sort of in the in the middle of our, our winter here. So we're excited. 
Great. Now, that it for the administrative report? That's all at this time. Okay. And no correspondence? So, uh, none at this time. Okay. And uh, so with future business, we have a meeting where we're going to have the preliminary budget, preliminary budget presented um, on March 4th at 6.30 p.m., which is a Thursday. And then we're back to Monday, March 22nd at 6.30 p.m. And Wednesday, March 31st, we're going to have our first budget workshop. So exciting stuff. Okay. <clears throat> if anybody is still following along and is interested in running, you know, we have elections up, but we have two wonderful candidates I hear might be uh, at the full paper. So good luck. Um, if there's nothing more. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I move to adjourn. I'll second. Okay. I'll do a vote, Rich. Aye. Janine. Aye. Diana. Aye. Chris. Aye. I'm an aye as well. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Bye, guys. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.